Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Shardell Spriggs, a program director in DTR NINDS and a program manager for the NIH Countermeasures Against Chemical Threats Program. Welcome to this webinar presentation to discuss our most recently published funding opportunity announcement. I will be joined during the presentation by Dr. Neil Drew, the Health Program Specialist for Counteract, and later by Dr. David Jett, Director of the Office of Neuroexposome and Toxicology Research, or ONETOX, at NINDS and the Counteract Program Director, as a panelist to answer questions. A quick reminder that we are recording this webinar and we will send the slides out to everyone that has registered. We will be taking questions through the chat box. Please enter any questions you have there at any time. After the presentation, we will answer as many of these as time allows. And for those that we cannot get to today, we will follow up with an email. In this webinar, we will present you with an overview of the Counteract program. Then we will speak about the specific new UG3 UH3 funding opportunity announcement. We'll share some tips and considerations for you to use when you construct your applications at the end of the presentation. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Drew to provide the overview. Good afternoon or good morning whichever might be appropriate for you. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. The NIH Counteract Program has been supported since 2006, and its mission is to understand fundamental mechanisms of toxicity for chemical threats, and then use that knowledge to develop safe and effective therapeutics to improve our nation's medical response capabilities. To do this, we support both basic fundamental research as well as uh, translational research up to the level of optimized lead compounds. So first, the question is, what exactly is a chemical threat? Uh, I think, next slide, please. Uh, the program is guided by a list of about 200 chemicals developed by the federal government. Applicants should uh, reach out to any of the scientific contacts listed on the funding announcements to confirm that the chemical or chemicals they wish to study are on this list. Uh, it is advisable to do this before you develop an application. Uh, so there are a broad uh, I guess broadly examples of chemicals of interest uh, include traditional chemical warfare agents such as nerve gases, toxic industrial chemicals, toxic agricultural chemicals such as insecticides, rodenticides, pharmaceutical based agents and other chemicals. And we cannot at this time share the list of uh, the full list of chemical threats with you, but we can discuss the list uh, in detail with you to facilitate your choice or confirm your choice. Now, one thing that is helpful is our toxidromes. This is where we have grouped chemicals on the list based on their mode of action and primary effect. This not only gives you an idea of the kinds of chemical threats, but some medical countermeasures developed for one chemical may also be effective for another chemical threat in that particular category or particular toxidrome. And these toxidromes are, uh, they include anticoagulants, blood agents, cholinergic warfare agents, cholinergic pesticides, convulsants, hemolytics, uh, opioids, lower and upper uh, pulmonary agents, and vesicants. So, as you might imagine, this needs to be a truly trans NIH effort because of the diversity of chemicals and their effects. So several other NIH institutes and their centers participate in the program based on their expertise needed to cover things like ocular skin, pulmonary, and other effects of the chemicals that we study. So besides NINDS, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, 
These other institutes include the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Eye Institute, and NIAD, or the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases that provides oversight and manages the contracts for us. And each institute, each IC, has a program officer assigned that can help you with specific scientific questions. The Counteract Funding Opportunity Announcements, or FOAs, are designed to feed into one another and promote a progressive translational program structure. This starts with basic mechanistic research grants. These funding opportunities are developed and run by the participating institutes. A couple have already been published and are accepting applications. Uh, they're listed uh, as the R01s and the R34, that's uh, they're listed as PAS 21245 and RFA ES 21006. Uh, following from that, we have exploratory R21 grants. And finally, we have our cooperative agreement funding opportunity, the newly published PAR 22209. And that will be on uh, hit to lead early stage therapeutic developmental research. And the goal here is to have at least one optimized lead compound that has been characterized well enough so that it can be transitioned for advanced development by an industry partner or the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA. Both of that, you know, that advanced development is beyond the scope of the Counteract program. So it's primarily the new funding opportunity, uh, the UG3, UH3, uh, hit to lead therapeutic development research funding opportunity that we're gonna be discussing today. And to do that, I'll turn this over to Counteract Program Manager, Dr. Shardell Spriggs. Thank you, Neil. Sometimes it's hard to know which counteract mechanism to apply to. So there are basic research FOAs that have been approved for all toxidromes. Some are on the street now and you may have seen them. Others are in the works. These are great entry points for investigators new to the field of medical countermeasures and for those that are not yet developing a therapeutic, but rather the pathology of chemical threat exposures. The R21 is the broadest research program we have. You can do almost anything in it, but the time and budget constraints make it the best choice for only a few things, such as developing an animal model or getting proof of principal efficacy data for more competitive applications to the cooperative agreement program. This includes repurposing drug candidates that have been approved for another indication in case you would like to see if it is efficacious as a therapeutic against chemical threats. Now, if you know a little bit more, uh, such as the target or mechanism or have several drug candidates for down selection, but need to conduct some ad me talk studies, or if you have a lead compound that hasn't been optimized yet, then the UG3, UH3 FOA that we wanna talk about a little bit more would fit best. And so this recent mechanism that we've just published has the goal of developing therapeutics to mitigate the adverse health effects of toxic chemical exposure. So this is the FOA where investigators would do most of the therapeutic development in our program. The projects should deliver a well-characterized therapeutic at the end of the funding period. So we uh, define a characterized therapeutic in the FOA as something that will have demonstrated affinity, potency, target selectivity and engagement, uh, in vivo efficacy studies, you have your ADME tox and an animal model that is predictive of the human condition during or shortly after a mass casualty event. And this includes timing and route of administration of the therapeutic. 
This FOA will only support research that is clearly relevant to the development of medical countermeasures that will enhance national medical response capabilities during or after a large scale chemical emergency. The overall scope includes validation of therapeutic targets through the early preclinical characterization of lead compounds. At the end of this, the goal is to hand these off to BARDA or an industry partner. Additionally, we aim to actually interact with these uh, BARDA and industry partners during the project period to facilitate a smooth transition. So there are some minimum FOA entry criteria we put in place. Uh, these are to help you be successful in this new program, which is much shorter uh, than the previous U01 programs that we had to accomplish some of the same goals. Those are that you need to have rigorous data supporting the hypothesis that modulating the putative drug target or affected pathway will produce a desirable outcome for the intended disease indication. We want you to have your initial lead compounds in hand that will serve as a starting point for optimization. You also need to have your assays in hand that you will use to down select to a single lead candidate for further optimization and characterization in the latter parts of this FOA project period. Uh, lead compounds that can be advanced towards optimization and development you, like, you need to have no obvious legal, i.e. intellectual property constraints to pursuing them, i.e. we ask you to have freedom to operate. Now for projects that are proposing to repurpose FDA approved drugs, many of the above entry criteria may have already been met. The budget of this opportunity announcement is $350,000 of direct cost annually for the UG3 phase and up to $450,000 in direct cost for the UH3 phase. Now we ask that you only request the budget that is necessary to conduct your studies. The overall project period may not exceed five years and neither phase can exceed three years. There are no renewals, that is no type twos on these projects. The first receipt date is coming up fast. It is October 17th of this year. Cooperative agreements are a NIH mechanism frequently used for high priority research areas such as ours that require substantial involvement from NIH program staff. Counteract cooperative agreement FOAs are managed with milestones. Milestone-driven research is used to ensure the research is focused on a well-defined goal and that the research activities achieve that goal with the greatest efficiency. The UG3, UH3 mechanism is a milestone-gated mechanism with distinct research areas and programmatic oversight. And we said the overall project period is five years. The first phase or first period of this mechanism is the UG3 phase. We ask you con to conduct fit to lead studies in that phase. The second phase is the UH3 phase. And that is where you will optimize your leads. Now the overall project period is five years and you decide based on your entry point into the program, how many years you spend in the UG3 phase and the UH3 phase and there are different budgets for those two phases. You must spend at least one phase in the UG3 period. Now, if you only choose to spend one year in the UG3 phase, that means you only have three years in the UH3 phase. Because again, that limit of three years in any one phase has been put in place. 
the overall application should come in as a single application with a research plan consisting of both phases. One complete package needs to come in and goes to review. These are still reviewed at a special emphasis panel that is run by CSR and we thank them very much for their help over the years. And these specific aims, please provide the overall goals for the entire application and indicate separately the specific aims to be accomplished in the UG3 phase and in the UH3 phase. For the milestones, the application must include well-defined annual milestones and timelines. For assessing progress in both the UG3 and UH3 phases, it may be helpful to do this in a Gantt chart. So again, those annual milestones are analogous to what we had in our previous U01 funding opportunity announcements. Now, what's new here is that you also need specific milestones for transitioning from the UG3 phase to the UH3 phase. This transition in phases does not automatically happen Okay, there is an internal administrative and scientific review that determines if the project warrants further effort to move into the UH3 phase of optimization. And this is one of the reasons you need to have an entire application packet because your project does not go back to review. We do this internally. So the UG3 phase should include hit to lead activities that enable down selection from candidate therapeutics to a single lead compound. And we encourage you to also have backup candidates. So we list some of the activities here, such as validating the target pathway and engagement, uh, any structure refinement that you need to do to optimize your hits into leads. Um, this preliminary proof of principle efficacy data and any other preparatory activities for the UH3 phase, such as optimizing your assays and optimizing uh, your animal models for exposure. At the end of the UG3 phase, the applicant should have completed all SAR activities to optimize compound structures and have demonstrated preliminary proof of principle efficacy, safety, and PKPD properties. The UH3 phase should include optimization activities that enable characterization of the lead candidate for further development. And examples of these activities include, but are not limited. And again, these are examples of activities. You must tailor them to your application, but determining the specificity, affinity, potency, target selectivity, and other properties, Importantly, uh, demonstration of therapeutic efficacy in a relevant animal model that is predictive of the human condition in a post-exposure event. Any in vivo dose ranging and efficacy studies, optimization of formulation and delivery systems. We also would like you to draft your preliminary target product profile, addressing questions of shelf life, storage conditions, and packaging. Uh, to ensure that anticipated use of the product is consistent with the intended use for which approval we sought from the FDA. Now, up to this point, we've talked a lot about milestones. So milestones are clear and quantitative outcomes that set go, no-go criteria for continuing the project. And again, you will need annual milestones for each year of your project and a, tr a transition milestone gating you from the UG3 to the UH3 phase. And so we wanna show you an example of a bad and a good milestone um, as an overall example, but please do visit our website for more information on milestones, including more examples. So here, uh, the milestone goal is to 
they're saying just test if drug X is efficacious in mice. So that is written as more of a task. That's not quantitative. And milestones protect the investigators as well as NIH program officers. If a new program officer takes over your project, uh, you definitely want to have things very, very clearly put in place. And again, if a new investigator, if the project is transferred, these help protect both sides um, of the story. So again, a good milestone is written below. We can see that we've gone from just testing a drug to demonstrate efficacy in reducing lethality when drug X is administered at 20 minutes after cyanide challenge. The criteria for success now is quantitative. We've put numbers or metrics of success in there. So now we want to see a reduction in lethality in mice by 50% when drug X is administered IM 20 minutes following an acute dose of cyanide via inhalation. Let me tell you when we're evaluating this, 24 hours after exposure. And then it is also helpful if you provide a rationale. Importantly, applications that are non-responsive to this funding opportunity announcement will not be reviewed. That means they will be administratively withdrawn prior to the special emphasis panel meeting. And so here we've listed all the non-responsive criteria that appear in the FOA. So the chemical threat that you are studying must be on the current Department of Homeland Security list of chemicals of concern. To ensure that it is, please contact us early. We are happy to go through the chemicals and make sure your application is responsive. The therapeutic must be amenable during or after a mass casualty scenario. We are largely servicing the civilian population and therefore drugs that have to be administered prophylactically or before exposure are not relevant to our program. Also, we are responding to emergency chemical threat events. So we are not interested in chronic chemical exposure models. We only support research on health effects after a single acute exposure event. Now, you may study long-term outcomes after an acute exposure event, but the exposure must be a single event. Please include quantitative, so numbers, benchmarks, go no go milestones in your application for each year and for the transition. Please clearly delineate activities that will occur in the UG3 phase and activities that will occur in the UH3 phase in the application. There is no advanced development activities, such as those listed here. So applications that propose uh, assay development for discovery of novel therapeutic compounds is better suited in our R21. Screening, such as high throughput screening to identify hits is better suited for the R21. Primary focus to develop the novel animal models is better suited for the R21. And we do not um, support diagnostics and or devices. Please contact us and we can see if you are uh, have an appropriate application for it, the SBIR or SCTR program. And again, therapeutics that are only uh, for specific vulnerable subpopulations will no longer be responsive in the program. Now you may look at subpopulations such as uh, the very young or the very old, pregnant, and specific diseases along with the normal adult population, but projects can no longer focus only on subpopulations in the program within this FOA.
Please read the specific notices listed here on enhancing and implementing rigor and transparency in NIH funded research. Pay, pay close attention uh, to describing scientific premise, uh, now rigor of the prior research, specifically the quality, including strengths and weaknesses of the data you include in your application. Present a rigorous experimental design, including proper statistical analysis and control of bias. Address sex as a biological variable. If you cannot use both sexes or you see no need to, have a good explanation why not. And too expensive is usually not an acceptable reason. Address authentication of key agents used in your research, including the chemical threat agent. So saying you purchased something from Sigma or other supplier is not sufficient. Uh, we've seen that. You will need to run an analysis to verify the identity and purity of key compounds. The emphasis here is on key and does not include minor reagents and buffers. And also, please do not use the vertebrate animal section for experimental details to circumvent page limits. A stuffing, as they call it, is not allowed. The reviewers are not required to consider the section for that purpose, and this may result in less enthusiastic review scores. So here we're sharing some important counteract specific things to consider, such as how therapeutic you are proposing will be used in humans, specifically having practicality in real world civilian mass casualty situations regarding timing and route of administration. So this is different than military applications. In the civilian space, we cannot predict when an incident will occur. This means the final product should have utility for emergencies involving acute chemical exposures uh, where medical intervention is required immediately, either in the field or later in hospital. We do encourage working with drugs that are already approved for other indication, since sometimes the regulatory pathway to approval is less difficult. And you may want to emphasize the relevance of repurposing in the innovation section, including quoting directly from this funding opportunity announcement. So for counteract in the research strategy section regarding this follow-up, please include the structure of your lead compound. This information is often helpful to reviewers in determining feasibility. Please include all letters of support. Uh, this includes from your collaborators, uh, definitely your appropriate biosafety committee, um, address biohazards in the application, uh, containment and disposal of, as well as facilities needed for research on restricted uh, chemicals, especially for chemical warfare agents, if appropriate. Now for intellectual property, uh, there is a one page addendum you may add. Please work closely with your institutional technology transfer office uh, throughout the research process to develop your IP strategy. You will minimally, again, need freedom to operate for this program. Uh, you should also try to make sure you have IP in place by the end of the project period to ensure a path forward to advanced development. So we have some further application considerations. Uh, these are largely developed from an analysis we did on summary statements uh, from prior applications. And these showed up frequently as weaknesses identified in applications, and we've listed them here for you. A scientific feasibility, uh, make sure you have the preliminary data and the literature that supports the hypothesis and proposed studies. Uh, some of these are grantsmanship issues, such as present sufficient details to evaluate the approach. Sometimes that's hard when you're coming from the position of an expert. Uh, it may be good to have someone who is not an expert in your field read your proposal. Uh, ensure the work meets the goals of the project. This is good to come back after you've written the proposal, look at your specific aims, and then look at the research you've proposed to do. Based on your entry point, 
and your exit point of your specific aims, make sure that matches with what you promise to do within the proposal. And if needed, and sometimes something that is always seen in translational research, be sure to address the interdependence of aims. Uh, sometimes it's something we cannot get around, but discussing alternative approaches to the research strategies presented sometimes helps. Uh, sometimes we see, I do this all the time, so I don't plan on having any problems, but um, a critical reviewer and even critical thinkers are going to want to see what may happen and, and try to give options for that. Also, regardless of whether you're an MPI application or not, it may be helpful to describe how your team will communicate. Just do you have regular lab meetings and things of that nature, just so they can see there's a path forward. Um, this can be more important if you have uh, multiple site locations for your research, but please keep these in mind. Okay, uh, thank you. So as mentioned earlier, the Counteract program reaches across many institutes of NIH. Each of them and their respective program officers with contact emails are listed here. Uh, if you have specific questions about how your research might fit with any of the ICs, either within the context of the cooperative agreement uh, funding opportunity or with the institute specific funding opportunities, we encourage you to contact the relevant program officer directly. Once again, I, uh, I will be sharing these slides with everyone. So yeah, you will have uh, these names and the contacts and uh, all the links that are embedded in the slide uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation materials. Uh, I'm now gonna turn to the questions. Uh, please submit your questions through the chat. I'll read them and, uh, and then we will answer them. Uh, so uh, the first question that came in was, uh, in the grant submission, do we need to identify an industry partner at the outset or is simply demonstrating a potential for industry partnership for the lead compound, will that suffice? Hi, this is Shardell. Um, in this FOA, there's not a requirement to have an industry partner upon entry. Okay. But I guess, should applicants have a plan for, I guess, who, I guess, um, who the industry partner should be upon exit? I think that would definitely be helpful uh, in review uh, for planning for forward. And then if you already have an industry partner there, you could also discuss the studies that they would like to see uh, to make sure at the end of it, they are still amenable to partnering with you. Uh, okay. You want me to comment on? Definitely, Dave. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Dave Jett. Uh, so this has, you know, been kind of an um, one of the goals of the program from the start. Um, there's, there's, you know, a lot of... Um, uh, parts of the program that are not that uh, attractive, let's say, to industry because of the potential small, um, the potential, the, the potential small uh, chance of making a lot of money on the bottom line. So, what we try to do is we try to talk to people and have we have meetings with them to show them how it's de-risked, you know, and it's de-risked in the sense that, you know, we'll pay for almost everything to drug approval if it goes to BARDA, things like that. We talk about, um, you know, contributing to national security. And then most importantly, we talk about dual use. So if we've got our job, we had a drug approved for seizures caused by nerve agents, but it's also 
being used as a standard of care for epilepsy. So you, there's things like that you can do. Um, and in terms of this FOA, yeah, it's not required, but if you can get an industry, par industry partner engaged at, the early, at this early stage, that would be a feather in your cap, I think, when, when people are reviewing the, um, re reviewing the applications. But like Dr. Spriggs said, it's not required as far as I understand. Okay, that's great. I'll jump to uh, this next question. It's uh, peripherally related. Can small businesses apply to the program? Hi. Uh, yes, small businesses are welcome to apply to the program. Um, depending on what you're developing, you, you can also apply through SBIR as well. So in that uh, specific example, I would just ask them to contact us directly. And so we can see what you're proposing to do. And then we could direct you in the best route because although you may apply to SBIR, you would go to an SBIR review where you may not, um, you know, fare as well as you would in a counteract review. But we have funded small businesses in the past uh, that have come into our program and, and they are welcome. Uh, okay. Um, so the next question that I have is if you can um, distinguish between compound screening, screening for compounds, which uh, was listed as one of the um, kind of non-responsive uh, topics. Uh, so it's not recommended uh, versus down selection from you know, uh, which which is a recommended uh, activity. Can you can you um, maybe expand on the difference between these two? Uh, sure. So if you have a high throughput screen that you want to run and you have a library that you want to test, that's not the place in this FOA. Um, we would ask that you conduct those activities uh, in the R21 and then take your promising hits uh, that you've identified there. So those hits or those initial scaffolds can, can be what you bring into this, this funding opportunity announcement, if that's clear. Okay, and then the down selection in this UG3, UH3 mechanism would be more like um, SAR refinement or something like that. Yeah, refinement of structures, it would, you know, you would just do your initial studies on, you know, I mean, five, 10 compounds. I mean, it, and then just, we would say which ones are most efficacious. Those are the ones that you would move forward from UG3 to UH3, because you may have several compounds that you think are going to work, but you would only move one forward into, you know, formulation studies or your in vivo animal model and things like that. Okay. Um, so the next question uh, is in the chat. I think everyone can see it. It's, it's um, a little lengthy. I'll uh, try to read it here. So given the budgetary limit, $450,000 per year for the UH3 phase, um, it's assumed that treatment with chemical agent analogs is acceptable. Uh, so for example, phenyl arsine oxide instead of lewisite. Uh, so I guess that's one question, but uh, extensive dose ranging and root studies involving chemical warfare agents in large animals, for example, pig, uh, requires offsite testing. So uh, it can be very expensive. Um, so this person's asking that they see that the only viable approach is to do initial studies with an analog and then final studies with the chemical warfare agent. Um, is that 
kind of how you see it or um, you know, how should one approach uh, this, uh, this kind of thing of like fitting the research in within the budget? Yeah, so fitting the research within the budget is going to um, be an in, you know, on an individual basis, what you can do based on the chemical threat and the animal models that uh, you choose. And what we have seen and heard from BARDA and also NIAD is that BARDA is reaching back a little earlier than they have previously. And they may not want to see these very large animal studies such as non-human primates done this early uh, in the research. So um, to answer that question, yes, swine um, you know, might be the largest animal you can go. We don't limit that because some investigators have resources and collaborations that allow them to do those studies. Uh, to answer the first part of the question, yes, uh, we do allow analogs um, for some of the chemical threats that are on the list. Just please contact the subject matter uh, expert PO for your particular toxidrome, and it will help walk you through that. Um, are there any aspects of the question I didn't answer? Or Dave, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I was trying to look at the chat and got dis, disturbed. Mm -hmm. uh, what was, so methamphetamines, is that the one? I just put No, something. this is more about, um, so the limited, you know, the $450,000 limit for the UH3 phase. Um, so then how do you do large animal uh, testing? So for, you know, like for example, in swine, um, yeah which can be very expensive, so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, that that's that's a, an issue and, you know, we have to, we have to make do with what we can with our limited budget. Um, I'd say that, you know, in some cases, you wanna have some good preliminary data with another animal than, zebrafish, maybe even another animal than a mouse. And if you can have at least some of that data at the end of both phases, you know, after the, the second phase, um, that would that would be good. Now, is BARDA or industry not going to be interesting interested at all? If you don't have pig or non-human pr uh, pr primate data, no, my experience is no. And in fact, sometimes they want to be involved when you start doing these pivotal animal studies with large animals. So I know that's fuzzy answer, but it's it's fuzzy. And so uh, our, in our portfolio now, we have people working anywhere from, you know, in silico all the way through large animals. Uh, so it's just going to have to be the case you can make for um, the value of the data that you're going to generate with the scientific approach. Okay. Uh, thank you. So we'll move to the next question. Maybe it's the one that you were distracted by uh, before. Uh, are methamphetamines included in the list of agents? Well, I'll put it in the chat. It's not on the list. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't scroll down that far. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, another question uh, in this vein. So in addition to development of pharmaceuticals, are other approaches like biophysical interventions, are these eligible? Uh, if you're asking me, <laughs> and did you say biophysical? Yeah, I. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, um, if we're talking about devices, it's tricky. Uh, at one point, we had a whole program for devices. Um, and, you know, I think 
I'm no. sure I didn't, you can correct me if you're if you're I think your fund announcement said it can't just be only on um a device. Um, but I, I I'm not sure about that. Um I can say that we have had proposals that came in with like um you know the uh stimulation study brain stimulation studies and things like that that have we we allowed to come in. Is that about right, Shardell? For uh, and again, I would if you have a specific question like that, I would encourage you to set up a call with us. One thing that uh, we didn't stress in the presentation is that we are more than happy to set up calls with PIs if you just reach out to Maria. Um, her information will be included in the slides that are sent out. We can set up 30 minute calls um, as a start to just talk about specifically what you would like to do. And then we can help point you in what we hope is the right direction. And then we can have follow on conversations as needed um, to help facilitate your application process. So hopefully, um, again, when you're into the weeds like that, we would really have to see what specifically you're trying to propose to see where we could fit that. And, and I would just, you know, if something in this FOA or in this presentation just seems uh, directly the opposite of what you wanna do, again, just reach out to us because um, there are other programs that we may be able to connect you with. And there are other aspects of the research you're trying to propose that we may be able to develop um, in certain funding opportunity announcements. So I, I hope the biggest take home message is to reach out to us um, so that we can help you. Okay. Um, I would like to try to get to a couple more of these questions. Um, the first is uh, for applicants that currently might be funded on uh, UO1, let's say, for example, the lead identification UO1, um, how do they transition from that to this UG3, UH3 mechanism? So if you currently have a UO1 lead ID and maybe you have two, you know, your lead and a backup. And so this is assuming that at the end of the lead ID, you actually, I guess, accomplished everything you, you sought out to accomplish. Sometimes that doesn't happen. So I would suggest you propose one to two years in the UG3. And you know this could be just you uh, doing. You can you can do your in vivo animal studies there for some initial, um, you know, proof of principle efficacy studies, and you would have a really good application to move forward to the UH three phase. Um, and so that's you have to propose one year in the UG three. And so I would. That's what I would propose. Just doing one year there and you would do three years in the UH3. And I, okay. I hope, hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, they, ha they, they can't come in just for the UH3. They have to do at least one year in the UG3. Yeah, and, and then... it's, it's, yeah, and it's attractive because there's that huge budget differential with those two phases. And so just know that you cannot propose more than three years in any one phase. Um, but we've had people come in to the optimization FOA that is a five-year program with just four years. So just propose what you need to get done, take a look at the FOA, give us a call, and then we can see, you know, maybe what you have left to do. And that can go in the UG3 phase. We can look at um, the technology readiness levels and, and, and try to help you figure out how to fit your research in each phase. Okay, great. So um, next question is uh, for the UG3 phase, do you encourage that applicants come in with one class of drugs or multiple classes of drugs? You can come in with multiple classes of drugs. 
in the UG3 phase, that's, that is fine. Um, and again, um, some programs or toxidromes in here want to see you uh, coming in and testing against at least two or three different chemical threat agents as well. So in that first UG3 phase, you know, you can just come in with all of the hits that you want to test with. And then you run your models and down select to what looks most promising. Yeah, I, I think I heard different toxidromes. Um, I don't think, I mean, it wouldn't stop you from coming in, but it, it'll be, I think, easier if you focus on several chemicals within one toxidrome so that they have potential um, broad spectrum of activity. But again, you know, I don't think we pre prohibit that, but it would be much easier if you just focus, you know, with one toxic one. Yeah, I agree. If, I, if that's what I said, I do agree with what you just said. Okay. And so then related, um, if an applicant proposes a class of drugs against a couple of chemical threat agents, let's say within uh, a toxidrome in the UG3 in the UG3 phase, and then uh, they can optimize these and ultimately against one chemical exposure in the UH3 phase with one lead drug candidate. Would that be appropriate? I, I would say yes. Okay. I think, um, it, I think it depends on how much time and funds you have left. Um, I would say that if I were an industry partner and I'm considering partnering, it would be great to see more. It would be great to see that this has the potential for um, being effective against that whole range of, let's say if it's anticoagulants, it will take care of all three or four of them on the list. Uh, so, but again, can you do all that research in that second half of the five-year program? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, um, so the next question is, uh, if you could clarify how an applicant could predict uh, a priori if an industry partner would produce the new drug so that it's available as a medical countermeasure. Oh, I'll take it, I'll take it. Well, I still <laughs> was leaving that for you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Dr. Jet, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> um, no, you can't ever predict that. Uh, but if I'm understanding the question, you know, you might have to talk to us and others about uh, small businesses or big businesses. You know, Pfizer and helped us with uh, with uh, Midazolam. And, and see if they have a record for doing these kind of studies. That might increase your chances. But, you know, in terms of actually predicting whether or not they're gonna take it in, to the finish line and, and get it to the market, it's, it's hard to predict. Um, at least that's what I would think, yeah. Uh, okay, so we just have a couple minutes left and a couple questions. So I think we'll uh, finish with these. Uh, so cholinergic pesticides are included on the list of chemicals. Are there particular pesticides uh, that are of greater interest than others, or are all OPs appropriate? Yeah, this is important too. So as I, Shardell, I'm pretty sure you said this already, but we, we have a policy where all of these chemicals um, are sort of like treated equal. Um, what that means is that when uh, you know you're the, you get these applications reviewed, you can't get slammed because someone thinks this chemical A is more important than this chemical B. And we put that policy in a long time ago for a variety of reasons. Um, so with that said, uh, yes, there's what? I don't know about, oh, maybe five or six OP pesticides. The best thing to do is give us a call. Tell us which one you work, which one or ones you want to work with, 
and we'll tell you if it's on the list. I mean, you know, some of the usual uh, things are on there, like chlorpyrifos and parathione and some carbamates and some others, um, and a few others, forate. So yeah, just give us a call. Yep, you said exactly what I was gonna say is that we don't prioritize them, but they do need to be on the list. So anything and everything may not be appropriate, but if it's on the list, it's treated equally in review. Okay. Um, then just the last two. So this was a follow-up to the question about the large animals. So it's just asking for confirmation that large animal studies are not required uh, because the, the funding opportunity says demonstration of efficacy in animal model that's more predictive of the human condition and more easily scalable in terms of therapeutic dose, for example, swine, non-human primates, et cetera. So uh, I can answer that. Yeah, it's not required. That was an example of something that someone could do. So you, you are allowed to do uh, large animal studies, let's say in the UH3 phase, uh, but it's not required. Um, and then the last question that we have uh, is a perfect segue to uh, ending the seminar, uh, which is if we can share the recording as well. And the answer is yes, of course. Um, I will uh, make the uh, recording available uh, from uh, the Counteract website uh, or the events page, and I will email everyone uh, at the same time that I send you the slides, I'll let you know that the recording is available. Um, so it takes a few days to prepare this, but um, you know it should be definitely by the uh, by the end of uh, next week. We should we should definitely have uh, this available on the web page. So um, you can review at your leisure. Uh, with that, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming to this webinar, and I want to thank Dr. Spriggs and Dr. Jett for uh, their presentation. And um, you know, so this this is now the end. So I'll stop the recording, and um, you know, I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. <laughs>